Well, I would I would say Chen Shui Bian has 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 learned many lessons from Li Donghui's uh, governance after he was elected in March of 1996 until the year 2000. I think uh, that the eight years under the DPP, basically, uh, we have seen the, the presidency become very, very um, forceful, very, very assertive. Let us say simply very, very proactive in doing what it wants to do. A good example of this from the, from, from the last four years under, under Chen Shui-bian is his use of the referendum. And have his promise now to use the referendum to revise the Constitution, which is, is illegal, as I understand, under the ROC Constitution. I'm saying that, there, that as the opposition grew in power, particularly from the new election law of 1979 that made for a much more fair uh, playing ground, uh, voting ground, campaigning ground for both parties. I learned this basically from one DPP person who had been involved in the passage of that new election law of 1979. Um, He's now the current, um, this DPP person is now the current, uh, he was an, he's one of, he's one of the great Dong Wai people and he's now the, uh, I think he's the head of, head of defense. Who am I trying to, whose name am I trying to re find? I've suddenly forgotten his name. He's Taiwanese. He was, he was uh, in the control yuan for a number of years and then he, and then he switched to the Department of Defense when, uh, when uh, the, uh, President Chen was elected in the year 2000. I'll, I'll think of his name. Oh, by the way, that gentleman's name was Kang Ningxiang. I just suddenly remembered it. But Kang Ningxiang was one of the key um, Uh, writers of that legislative law of 1979 that uh, made the <clears throat> the campaigning rules, the raising of money rules, e with e the same for for all parties concerned. He was one of the, the the important people working with KMT legislators that made that 1979 law a, a, a more fair, truly democratic law. And as if you trace election trends after 1979, the DPP continues to do better and better and better. It learns to campaign better, it learns by doing, but it also has the benefit of this equalized playing field for both political parties. And then through some very unusual circumstances of the, of the decade of the 90s, when the KMT party starts to split, we end up in the year 2000 with an election in which the KMT party has indeed split and loses the election. Only a month ago when the, when the next election was held and the DPP was running f f considerably far behind and all the public opinion polls showed that, there, the alliance has been formed and it looked like the alliance was going to win. As it turned out, the peculiar events of, of March 19th led to an election outcome where the alliance did not win. And now the KMT very likely will go through a very, very difficult time. But meanwhile, Taiwan society is divided and it's not going to be easy for this president to to get legislation passed that would enable him to change the Constitution along the lines that he and his party would like to see. So the only way it seems that he can go around that is through popular referendum. So sure. I've, I've written the book, you know, with a colleague here at Hoover, uh, this is Linda Chow, in which we go into great detail the years of the 70s and particularly the 80s 
leading up to the election of 1996. And uh, it's clear that although Jiang Jingguo was increasingly ill through the 1980s, he sees, he sees a, an opposition force in Taiwan that's gaining ground, gaining popular support, it's learning to play by the democratic rules. And uh, <clears throat> his, 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 his big contribution, I think, came in 1986 when he told um, Mayush, Malish, um, not, no, he told his, his uh, Mishu Zhang of the party that there is going to be a series of reforms leading to constitutional reform and the setting up of a, um, an elect, of a full electoral democracy. And uh, the events of the 1980s were, were very, very turbulent events. There were street demonstrations that got, that got bigger and bigger and potentially more violent. But they were permitted by the government and uh, there were more and more elections at the local government, at the, at the uh, provincial government, and, uh, and leading eventually to, uh, to the constitutional changes that came under Li Donghui and the KMT. But Jiang Jingguo in, those, in the later years, I think, saw that there was nothing he, could, he and his party could do to slow down the trend of the what was happening with the, with the opposition party under the Dong Wai movement. Zhang Jingguo, I think, just realized that the, the time for democracy had come and there was no way to, to stop it, least of all slow it down. He hoped that, he hoped, I think the gamble that he really had in mind was that the KMT could under, undergo another Gaizao, Gaizao uh, experience, a re reconstruction of the party. You will recall that in, between 1950 and 1952 and 53, the KMT was disbanded and then recreated once again under a total set of new rules and personalities. And Zhang Jingguo hoped that the KMT could go through again another kind of purification and Remoral dedication to clean government, to establishing good high standards of official behavior, and so forth. And in this way, he he hoped that through democratic elections, the KMT could be the superior party that would have the moral high ground and win these elections. But uh, his dream didn't come through. Uh, he chose a vice president who was a Taiwanese, and this vice president skillfully was able to consolidate his own power in the KMT and um, bring a lot of people around to his thinking about how democracy should be promoted. And Li Donghui is probably will probably go down in Taiwan history as one of the most brilliant, important political leaders that Taiwan ever had. He is loved by many and hated by many others. And uh, we still don't have a, a true study of Li Donghui, the man, and the politician. But he is the one clearly responsible for the great changes that occurred in the 1990s. And Zhang Jingguo, who died in 1988, uh, in January, uh, simply um, did not was not able to uh, stay around long enough to to carry out his so-called Gaizao Guomindang. It's ironic that the corruption that occurred under Li Donghui's presidential uh, leadership got worse and worse, and that the KMT got the rap for that rather than President Li Donghui, who allowed it to happen, and who, in fact, allowed it to happen by appointing his cronies all over the place. 
and uh, by by basically looking the other way, worrying more about national security and building up the arms race, uh, worrying about, um, of course, Beijing's Communist Party played right into Li Donghui's hands. Because every time Li Donghui stood up and said um, that um, we don't want we we don't want to be part of China, or we want to continue a, to be a democracy, and we'll wait until China democratizes, which probably will be never. Uh, Li Donghui, in that way, infuriated Beijing, and they overreacted, uh, sent some missiles flying over Taiwan, and thereby uh, angered the Taiwan people, and unified many of them to support Li Donghui, who they admired because Li Donghui stood up and and uh, talk tough to the communists, which he did. He was a very effective leader. But he had his own agenda, and his agenda was basically to promote democracy, which could then be used as a political tool to promote Taiwan nationalism. Now, this was not what the Kuomintang Party was all about. The Guomindang party of Chiang Kai-shek and Jiang Jingguo was basically to work out some kind of political arrangement with Beijing so that both could start to cooperate and then in the long run have some kind of a unification. Nobody knew how or what or when that would happen. But that was the Guomindang's great mission. That was the mission that, lead, that, that Jiang, Jiang Jingguo believed that his new vice president that he handpicked would carry out after he died. Li Dongwei had no son. That was a good thing from the standpoint of Jingguo's evaluation of the trustworthiness of Li Dongwei. He, he squared, or basically made the road to power easy for Li Donghui. He admired Li Donghui. He trusted Li Donghui. He gave Li Donghui a crash course in the last few years of his life about how to be president when he was gone. He did everything to put Li Donghui in power, believing that Li Donghui would carry out the long-term mission of the Jiang family and the KMT. Li Donghui started to do that, and then Several years into that, he completely reversed himself and decided that he was going to use democracy as an umbrella to promote Taiwan nationalism. How, how much is the KMT party responsible or, you know, like, is it 50-50, like Li Donghui, and it's the party's character or, you know, the people and the party's character at that time to, to be, to go down that Road. Go down that road with Li Dongwei. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure, you know, KMT has to take... This is a new question, and it's a good one, because I've asked myself that question many times. Why did so many people who saw Li Dongwei starting to behave differently, particularly after 1993 and 1994, why did they stay in the party? Why didn't they stand up and criticize him? Why didn't they um, put up a fight? Well, you remember that some did. These were the, these were the young Turks, uh, generally Maylanders, who left and formed their own party. Um, and they would campaign vigorously in 1996. Remember, they, they had uh, Halbertson as their, um, I think, as their president candidate. I forgot who the vice president candidate was. But... <laughs> I would, I would have to say that these were basically party members who, who didn't want to lose their job, who didn't want to lose their power, who didn't want to lose their prestige. And uh, they decided to keep quiet and go through this whole period hoping for the best. And through their complicity and through their um, willingness to go along with what the president was doing, Li Donghui was able to weaken and ultimately split 
the KMT, and truly, uh, what I would say, divert the KMT from its long historical mission of trying to transfer Sanmin Jui to mainland China. You'll remember that there was a very famous kohao, or cliche, that, that President Zhang Jingguo used to tell not only the KMT, but the, but the people of Taiwan, that what the KMT stood for all through the 1980s was to e Sanmin Jui, Wei Tongyi Zhongguo. Use the principles of Sun Yat-sen's three principles of the people in order to unify Taiwan and China around a democracy, a nation state, and a prosperous welfare for the ordinary people of China and Taiwan. But the party lost its way in, in the year 2000. Lianzhan tried to revitalize the party, tried to, tried to get it into, whip it into shape for the, 19, the, the 2004 election. He managed to have an alliance with, uh, with uh, one of the great splinter groups that had separated from the party, that is uh, Sung Chuyu. But they failed in their bid for the presidency. And now the question is, what happens to the KMT? Zhang Jingguo is a kind of ideal, and... Yi San Wei Tong Yi Zhongguo. Okay. So... I don't know whether the division is as clean-cut as that. Um, this is still a party with many people who feel that uh, this is the best livelihood, best career they can have, and so they just go along with whatever the party decides. Uh, the real leaders in the party have yet to stand up and replace the, two, the current uh, leader, Lian Zhan, and his colleague, Sung Chuyu. But uh, the vision of, the, clearly the vision of, um, if I could be allowed to, to paraphrase or, or, or very simply sum up what I think the vision of Lian Zhan is, it's a vision that... Um, Taiwan's future is closely linked with China. Taiwan has a constitution. It has a government that still claims to represent China, whatever that means. It's, and that, this, that Lian Zhan's party would, if they, if they were in power, they certainly would find ways to sit down and talk with Beijing about probably creating something like a Banglian arrangement, some kind of a loose, loose commonwealth arrangement, where Taiwan's democracy, national security, and economic prosperity would all be guaranteed without China's interference or any, any direct or indirect um, influence in Taiwan but that Taiwan would work with mainland China to try to modernize and democratize and basically change the character of China as it is today. I think this is the vision that many people associated with the KMT buy into to a certain extent, some more than others. But yet these people still feel very close to Taiwan. They feel that Taiwan is their home. After all, I, how, how could the KMT brought, brought th almost three million people into the streets and into, into the big cities and a half a million gathered before the president's office on, uh, I believe, wasn't it March 1st, in that huge rally that followed the 228 rally by the DPP? And that, that that rally had many people who, who clearly believed that Taiwan was their motherland too. So I think to a certain extent the KMT has become a big umbrella party to include as many people as they can include, but there is a core message there that somehow Taiwan must deal with the China factor and that that will call for some kind 
of a political arrangement of co -op, built on cooperation, something like a Banglian, or what I call a commonwealth. Someone described to me that this Bentuhua division of the KMT is simply Li Donghui's people. Um, if Li Donghui is supporting, currently right now, supporting the Green Party in Chen Shui-bian, doesn't that mean, or doesn't that sort of suggest that there are members in the KMT that are not really on the KMT and blue side? It might. It's possible. But remember, DPP leadership has the same problem in their party. There's lots of people who who belong to the Green Party and, and see that they t that the party has to deal with the China factor somehow. They feel bun tu hua, but they don't necessarily fit, fee, uh, they don't necessarily feel so strong as to say washer washer ega tai du da, tai du funza or whatever. You know, I'm not something really for total Taiwan nationalism and Taiwan separation from China. I think both parties have this problem to, to, to a certain degree. Mind you, the country now seems to be divided pretty equally, and this division has spread overseas to Chinese communities. And that, that itself would, I think, give some uh, credibility to what I've just said about the complexity of these two big political alliances that have been competing in the last four years. I think it's, I think the tougher that Washington, the tougher line that Washington takes toward warning Chen Shui-bian's government not to change the status quo and try to do the things that he's always talked about, the more people see that tough Washington stance, I think the more they will take a status quo, broadly complex view about Taiwan's future. The more reluctant they are going to be, it seems to me, to uh, uh, maybe vote for, vote for some sort of gungto to change the Constitution. I think now you've got more complexity than ever in the Taiwan electorate. And uh, as people get older, people get more educated. Um, or as people get older and not educated, uh, you're going to see this complexity continue. But I think hanging on to the status quo now is what the majority wants. And the more the United States warns Chen Shui-bian not to move from that status quo, if the United States is firm and continues in its firmness, then I think Chen Shui-bian has got to be very careful. He cannot proceed with the, with the recklessness that he has proceeded in the last four years. Does it have, I'm just wondering if what we're doing here in the United States, those kind of demonstrations in the United States have any kind of impact in Taiwan? Like, I don't know what kind of demonstration you were speaking. Uh, th there is one kind of demonstration, for example, by, by pan-blue supporters who are bitter about being cheated out of the election, who are now telling the United States and telling Congress, do you want to send American boys to, to, to fight and die in the Taiwan Straits for a government that was illegally elected and cheated its people out of an election? For a cheating democracy that's not a full democracy? That's the message that some people now are trying to promote in Washington. Now, I don't know whether that's the message that you were thinking of. I suspect it was not, and that the message you were thinking of had more to do with trying to rally support and lobby Congress and the White House to support Taiwan's democracy. They've just had an election. The, the, uh, it, it seemed to be, uh, it, was, it was disputed, but it seems to have been a fair election. And uh, why can't you support a democracy that, and stand up, to, stand up to communist China's pressures? Uh, D.C., Houston, Chicago, San Francisco, and L.A. Um, to do what? Just moral support, uh, just, just to protest the, what they see as, a, as an illegal inauguration. Oh. 
Well, then you're talking about what I said f formerly rather than laterally. Because the protests that I have heard in the that that will be that will be made, I guess, around uh, inauguration day is telling the United States people and government, uh, do you want to have American boys die for a, an illegal, unfair democracy, or a phony democracy, or whatever? That's that to me is a very very uh, strong criticism of this current government. And it's likely, if it gets support from in Taiwan and outside of Taiwan, it's really going to handcuff this current administration. Okay, I, I but was, it's hard to say what's going to happen. I, I mean, I was, I was trying to speculate on uh, what, I'm, I'm sure that they knew they would get a lot of heat for this. Um, but but it's the only sure. way they could win and, and hang on to power and continue their, their agenda. So, so I guess I'm wondering what their long-term plan is. Are they just hoping this will blow over eventually? I think so. They're hoping that time will heal this problem and that uh, once the momentum of, of, of uh, Bantu Hua can be accelerated again, uh, one, one thing that the president may do within a year into his, into his new presidency or final presidency is to uh, perhaps uh, make Minan Hua the national language in the schools and just teach uh, just teach Bai Hua uh, just teach the North China doc dialect as a um, as a secondary language to do business uh, in the world. There's been talk about this possible language reform. In this way, this would, this would marginalize critics, and it would bring more people into a sense of Taiwan identity, now that they all had to speak Taiwanese in ordinary life, in schools, government, everywhere. This, they, there may be this attempt to I, this is one of the things I would strongly go out on a, line, a limb and predict will probably happen. Nationalism, nationalist governments that have been able to create new nation states have always been able to do so by appealing to, to language and cultural linkages. And the more you can promote that, single language and the culture related to that language and then aim it at an enemy in your society those who who resist it disapprove of it oppose it then then you get rid of them they have to leave or they have to cave in and follow the new the new the new the new nation civilization and I think this is very much what Lee is probably telling Mr. Chun that he has to do. He has to speed up Taiwan nationalization in order to build a solidity and a base in Taiwan. But, you, but they run a risk in doing that. And what is the risk? The risk is to change the status quo, or at least the perception of the status quo is changing. That's the risk that Lee and Chun would, would, would face, I think, if Chun goes so far as to declare not only a gungto for trying to revise the Constitution, but by presidential order saying that, well, we're going to, the, the Zhao Yubu or the Ministry of Education is going to produce a national plan for the Taiwanization of our language. There seems to be uh, quite a bit of... Well, it wasn't illegal by according to the, to the law passed by the, the legislative UN uh, within the year before the election. I guess, I guess according to that law, which I'm not terribly familiar with, uh, the, the, the right of referendum was was put into the law statutes. 
the president was clever enough to use several tell of that to be able to say, look, I want to ta ta add on a, um, um, a gungto for this election. But where I think that is illegal is because that allows the president to more or less bias the nature of the election. Well, after all, if you're, if you're going to, uh, if the president is going to introduce his, his special um, gungto or, or um, <laughs> um, national referendum, uh, he's preempting the people's right to come up with their own referendum. And uh, what gives him the right to do that? I mean, the, P the gungto is a, is a weapon of the people, basically. When the people can't red get redress from an elected leader or from a law on the books and they, they see that there has to be some change, it's their right to stand up and sign their names and produce enough signatures willing to have a vote on this. For the president to do that for himself, I'm not sure that, 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 that the law that the legislative yuan passes uh, truly allows that to happen. And if it does, it's a very bad law to allow the president to have his own referendum. That's carrying presidential power too far.